September and October and the first week of November, the candidates carry their message to the people. It started in July when the Democratic Party nominated Senator John F. Kennedy for President of the United States and for Vice President, Senator Lyndon B. Johnson. The party united behind its candidates. Richard M. Nixon was the choice of the Republican Party. He had served as Vice President of the United States since 1953. Now he was a candidate for the presidency. His vice presidential running mate Ambassador Henry Cabot Lodge. As the campaign gets underway, the presidential candidates meet face to face in television debates seen and heard by millions of people. The same people who will decide which of these two men shall lead the country for the next four years. But personal contact with the people is still an essential feature of an American presidential campaign. Senator Kennedy, a tireless campaigner, goes to all sections of the country spelling out his views on domestic and foreign policy. On foreign policy, the overriding issue is the maintenance of peace and meeting the challenge of the international situation. On domestic affairs, he stresses the government's role in meeting economic and social problems. Senator Kennedy's wife, Jacqueline, has to limit her campaign appearances because she is expecting a child. But still, she is seen by thousands. Give me your help. Give me your hands and your voice to move America forward. With these words, Senator Kennedy asks the people to support his candidacy and his program. In 14 weeks of campaigning, he attracts enormous crowds. Each of the two candidates travels more than 60,000 miles. They go to small towns and big cities. At railroad stations, airports, and public squares, they meet the people of America. With Vice President Nixon is his wife, Pat. He introduces her to the people, and then he speaks of his program. He speaks of the progress of these past eight years and the need for keeping experienced leaders at the helm of the nation. In their travels, the candidates visit American Indian communities, seeking their votes. They meet with people in all parts of the country with easygoing informality and with a sense of humor. Beginning in Hawaii in the sunny first weeks of September, the campaign stretches into early November when the first snow starts to fall in the eastern states of Pennsylvania and New York. By this time, the issues of the campaign have been made clear. Tuesday, November 8th, is election day all over the country. Streets and buildings are decked with flags. The campaign clamor has died down and given way to quiet reflection. In all the 50 states of the Union, this is a legal holiday. Many places of business are closed. The people are urged to exercise their right to vote. Beginning in the morning hours, they line up in front of firehouses, schools, community halls, and private homes at the places designated as election centers. In some places, the voting is by paper ballot. In others, it's by automatic voting machine. On entering the booth, voters everywhere first register their choice for president and vice president. Then in the different states, they elect 34 senators, 437 members of the House of Representatives, and 27 governors. They elect judges, assemblymen, and other officials. They approve or reject tax proposals for school, road, or housing projects. They vote for or against amendments in their state constitution having their own opinion as to how each vote affects their community, their children, their country. The 
The main interest centers around the election of a new president. And today, on election day, the big question is, how will the people vote? In which state will they favor the Republican candidate? In which state will they favor the Democratic candidate? There have been many public opinion polls and many guesses, but no one really knows for certain. Everyone has said this would be a close election. In the early morning hours, a helicopter lands near Gettysburg, Pennsylvania, bringing the nation's first citizen, President Eisenhower, to the polling place where he will cast his ballot. At the president's polling place, located in a fireman's hall, it is still too early to vote. No exception is made for the president. He has to wait five minutes until seven o'clock. The press always asks the president jokingly for whom he is voting, but he won't say. Mr. Eisenhower is completing two terms in office as a president deeply loved and respected by the people. Of the two ballots he drops in the box, one is on a proposed consolidation of local schools. A few hours later, at the same polling place, it is Mrs. Eisenhower's turn to vote. Voting hours and voting regulations vary from state to state. In Maryland, the ambassador of Japan and his wife are among diplomatic representatives of all nations invited by the United States government to observe election procedures in various communities. The ambassador is among the observers at a polling station where voting machines are used. Another famous signature on the election registers is that of Vice President Nixon. Together with his wife, Pat, he casts his ballot in the small town of Whittier, California, where both went to school, where they were married, and where today they cast the most important vote of their lives. Senator Kennedy and his wife Jacqueline vote in his native town, Boston, Massachusetts. Photographers and reporters are all around them, for this is the man who in the next 24 hours may become President of the United States and she First Lady of the Land. In the cities of America, in thousands of election precincts, the signs of this special day are everywhere. With quiet pride, people go to the polls. Today, perhaps more than any other day, they feel deeply conscious of being part of their country, deeply committed to it, deeply involved in its future. In New York, the ambassador of Burma is among those observing American citizens preparing to cast their ballot. The American voters in turn observe the Burmese visitors with interest and with a feeling of kinship. The kinship felt by all people who have the right to choose the leaders of their government. On November 8, 1960, 67 million Americans go to the polls to do exactly that, to choose those who will govern the country in their name. That same evening, as the polls close in the eastern states, the whole country begins to await the results. The television networks have made elaborate preparations to broadcast the election returns as they come in from the different parts of the country. The headquarters of the major television networks are equipped with entire batteries of tabulating machines and with electronic computers to forecast the trend of the election on the basis of early returns.
At party headquarters, people gather for what they hope will be a victory celebration. Huge tally boards post the returns as they come in minute by minute, hour by hour. From the very beginning, it becomes obvious that this is going to be a close election. After some early encouraging reports for Vice President Nixon, it appears that Senator Kennedy is moving into the lead. The news is flashed on the moving bulletin sign in New York's Times Square. Then comes the electrifying news that Senator Kennedy has won the state of Connecticut by a larger plurality than expected. He now has eight electoral votes. 269 are needed to win the election. His supporters are jubilant. We want Kennedy! We want Kennedy! We want Kennedy! Senator Kennedy is recorded as leading in 17 states with a total of 192 electoral votes. In following the returns, all eyes are on the map of the United States. Each one of the 50 states has a certain number of electoral votes according to the size of its population. Pennsylvania has 32 electoral votes, New York 45. Other key states are California, Ohio, Texas, and Illinois. In Illinois, the voting will be so close that the lead will go back and forth from one candidate to the other. But then, this turns into a seesaw battle in quite a few of the states, all night long. All night long, the figures keep building up. In state after state, millions of voters split their ballots, backing one presidential nominee, and then voting for candidates from the opposing party for senator, governor, or congressman. Senator Kennedy's early lead of two million votes dwindles perilously as the returns come in from the western states. But he holds on to his advantage in electoral votes. The returns are checked by his press secretary, Pierre Salinger. At the press headquarters of the Democratic presidential candidate in Hyannisport, Massachusetts, all eyes are on the screen as television commentators announce that Vice President Nixon is about to make a statement. In the East, the time is 3.20 in the morning. In Los Angeles, California, on the West Coast, it is 20 minutes past midnight. Vice President and Mrs. Nixon appear before their loyal supporters. The scene is broadcast on television screens all over America. The presidential candidate of the Republican Party makes his statement. I want to say that one of the great features of America is that uh, we have political contests, that they are very hard fought, as this one is hard fought, and once the decision is made, we unite behind the man who is elected. I want all of you to know, I want all of, I want all, I, I, I want, I want Senator Kennedy to know, and I want, all of you to know that uh, certainly if this trend does continue and uh, he does become our next president that he will have my wholehearted support and your support. It is in the best tradition of American politics. Rising above his own personal disappointment, Vice President Nixon has shown the way to his supporters. He has asked that in the event of Senator Kennedy's victory, the nation unite behind the new president. As the night wears on, deserted chairs are the symbol of discouragement at Republican headquarters. But the popular vote is still dramatically close. In the end, it will be a narrow victory in Minnesota that will give Senator Kennedy a sure hold on the electoral vote of the states. As morning comes to the cities of the eastern states, the newspapers headline Senator Kennedy's election to the presidency. Yet at this hour, the popular vote is so close that it appears he will win by a plurality of less than 1%. Other American presidents have been elected this way. 
some of them including Abraham Lincoln and Woodrow Wilson by an even lower percentage of the popular vote. So John F. Kennedy, the 43-year-old senator from Massachusetts, becomes president-elect of the United States. As president of all the people, his family also becomes the center of nationwide interest. His three-year-old daughter, Caroline, and his lovely wife, Jacqueline. Shortly after Vice President Nixon officially concedes the election in the early afternoon of Wednesday, November 9th, Senator Kennedy appears before the press in Hyannisport, Massachusetts. With him are his wife, his father and mother, his many brothers and sisters. After acknowledging congratulatory wires from President Eisenhower and Mr. Nixon, he addresses all Americans. To all Americans, I say that uh, the next four years are going to be difficult and challenging years for us all. The election uh, may have been a close one, but I think that there is general agreement by all of our citizens that a supreme national effort will be needed in the years ahead to move this country safely through the 1960s. I ask your help in this effort, and I can assure you that uh, every degree of mind and spirit that I possess will be devoted to the long-range interests of the United States and to the cause of freedom around the world. So now uh, my wife and I prepare for a new administration and uh, for a new baby. Thank you. It is the climax of one of the closest, most dramatic elections in American history.